It smells so good when he farts. Yeah, so the Dragon Prince Season 4 dropped recently, and let's just say that it could have been better. After a three year wait, fans were ready to jump back into Zadia and catch up with their favourite heroes and villains. But what they got was a poorly paced slog of a season that was all set up and no payoff. There are plenty of issues with the latest season of the Dragon Prince, from its lame humour... I suppose if the kingdom is having a guest, I ought to welcome her with a dragon sized jelly tart. Not the size of a dragon. <laughs> Uh, no, no, your majesty. Uh, the size a dragon would eat. You see, the joke is that he's making a big jelly tart, not a very big jelly tart. A great joke. To its nonsensical plot lines, if you had the whole time skip to retrieve Viren's staff, why would you wait until the day your PTSD riddled dad gets out of a two year coma to drag him up the very mountain he fell off and died? WHY ARE YOU TELEPORTING TO THE BOTTOM OF THE MOUNTAIN?! But that's already been discussed. What I want to focus on is an aspect of the show that's been bugging me since the start. Its relationship to Avatar The Last Airbender. For those that don't know, The Dragon Prince is a Netflix animated fantasy series co-created by Aaron Ehatz, head writer on Avatar The Last Airbender. It also reunites Aaron with Jack DeSena, the voice of Sokka, who plays the main character Callum in The Dragon Prince. After its initial announcement, this association created a buzz around this new IP within the Avatar fandom, propelling the Dragon Prince beyond the limited promotion it received from Netflix and providing a pre-existing close-knit audience before it had even debuted. The show's links to Avatar are mostly a positive thing, but in other ways, clinging to the cast and crew's past successes and trying to replicate what made Avatar special in a completely different show are holding the Dragon Prince back. And this is happening on several levels throughout the show, but it's easy to overlook when the basic things like story and character are working. However, when those things start to fail, like in season 4, those issues start to become more apparent. The Dragon Prince's most overt references are jokes that specifically call back to things from Avatar. Yep, yep. Mostly, these jokes are completely harmless. Someone who's a fan of both shows will appreciate the reference, and usually, someone who hasn't seen Avatar won't even realize there's a joke they're supposed to be getting, with a few exceptions. Boomerang? These jokes are a fun way of giving back to the Avatar fandom, seeing as the Dragon Prince's initial popularity was down to the community's goodwill towards Aaron and Jack. However, if I am being critical, I'd say that these callbacks are emblematic of the Dragon Prince's deeper problems, of relying on Avatar's popularity rather than building its own. It sometimes feels like the Dragon Prince is insecure about standing on its own feet, so it reinforces its links to ATLA, and these oblique callbacks are the most obvious sign of that. And I get it, Avatar's proven it can stand the test of time. With its Netflix re-release and the upcoming live-action remake, ATLA's cultural capital is as high as it's ever been. So I get why the Dragon Prince would want that association, but when I see these jokes, the cynical part of me wonders if it's really about rewarding fans or about getting clips of the Dragon Prince reposted in Avatar Discord groups and subreddits and other fan spaces as viral marketing for Aaron's new show. Honestly, the truth is probably a little bit of both, which is why these callbacks make the Dragon Prince feel insecure about its own strengths. After four seasons, the Dragon Prince fandom is still being treated as an extension of Avatars rather than its own independent thing. But having said all that, these references are really the least of the show's issues, given the other humour on offer. I'd never seen anything like it. Flew right in surrounded by glowing sparkles and shiny bits. I mean, when it arrived, I literally... Let's just say these aren't the same trousers I wore to work this morning. Wait, the bird made him cop?
On a subtler note, how the Dragon Prince presents itself to its audience is designed to be as familiar to ATLA fans as possible. From styling its episodes as chapters and calling each season a book themed around an element, to so many fundamental features of its world building, the look and feel of the show has been created to evoke a sense of, it's just like Avatar, but even more. Avatar had four elements, the Dragon Prince has six. Avatar had two mascot animals, the Dragon Prince has three. The Fire Nation had Agni Kais, the Fire Elves also have Agni Kais. The Dragon Prince understands the features of Avatar's world building, but not how they fit together to create an engaging setting for the audience. So when it tries to replicate them in Zadia, it comes across as a hollow imitation. It's not disastrous, this isn't High Guardian Spice or anything, Zadia is an okay setting, but when you compare it to ATLA, which it's trying to ape, you quickly see where it's falling short. This is Avatar's map, though you probably didn't need me to tell you that because it's one of the first things you'll see in literally every episode of ATLA, and it's a really good map. The team behind Avatar knew that to give their audience a sense of the hero's journey and progress, they needed to familiarise viewers with the layout of the world. So they created this simple, elegant, informative map that can be read at a glance and slapped it into the intro where it would be repeatedly drilled into the audience's memories. Even someone who's never seen the show could intuit that the Fire Nation is the red hot island with all the volcanoes or that the North and South Water Tribes are the icy blue bits at the top and bottom of the map. And anyone with even a passing knowledge of the show could tell you that the Earth Kingdom is the big continent where you can even see the giant walls of Ba Sing Se. With just a little bit of colour coding and some common sense, this map tells a newcomer all they need to know about Avatar's world in seconds. This is the Dragon Prince's map of Zadia, also shown in the opening to its first three seasons, and by comparison, it tells me nothing. The landmass is divided between humans and Zadians by the lava fissure, and that is clearly marked, but anything else is just a guess. Which side is human and which side is Zadian? Where's Catolis or Luxoria or the Moonshadow Village? I can't see any of the important locations or know how far they are from each other, making the world feel vague and empty. And this might not seem like such a huge deal, but when your story is about the journey across this continent, it's important to give your audience a sense of space so they can understand the progress the heroes have made. And before anybody says anything, yes, I know there's a better version of this map out there, but if it isn't in the show and I have to go online to find out where basic locations are, then it doesn't count. This idea of recognising Avatar's basic details but not knowing how to apply them properly runs deeper when you compare how both shows handle their different cultures. Avatar continues that clean and clear definition with major societies denoted by their own sense of colour, design, lifestyle and architecture. Like the map, this gives enough info for a surface level viewer to distinguish the differences, but because ATLA is drawing on real world influences, there's a surprising amount of authenticity and depth gone into cultivating each of the four nations for anybody who wants to explore the world a little bit deeper. The closest comparison in the Dragon Prince is with the Elves, who are also divided by element type. Except, Instead of pulling from that rich influence of various East Asian traditions, it feels like the only cultural touchstone in creating the Elves was World of Warcraft. There just isn't the same depth to their societies, so they don't really have cultures so much as they just have accents. But at least I could tell you which Elf belongs to which tribe. For the human kingdoms, there really isn't anything. I can't really tell you what the point of the other kingdoms is, or how they're different to Catullus, or how they're being impacted by the events of the story because they seem to have been forgotten. Whereas Avatar trimmed its world down to four cultures that were essential for the story, and it could provide appropriate focus to flesh out, the Dragon Prince is carrying a lot of excess weight because it's trying to do what Avatar did, but now with even more kingdoms and more elements that the story cannot facilitate. Even in the magic system, when compared to bending, the magic in the Dragon Prince is a lot more varied, with more elements and dark magic and primal spells and incantations and potions and 
a load more stuff. But all that variety is making it harder to define to the audience what the magic is and what the rules are, rather than something simple to grasp like, you know, Kung Fu with fire. We can't understand what the rules of the Dragon Prince's magic are as easily, so it comes across as vague and wishy-washy. I mean, I made this meme back in Season 1 about how the show tells us that dark magic is a shortcut, but the events of the story clearly suggest otherwise, and I'm still not sure the Dragon Prince understands this four years later. But let's be clear, these are criticisms of the setting, not actual criticisms of the show. Dodgy world building isn't a make or break factor when the basics like story and character are able to carry a show. The problem is that when those things stop working, like this season's pacing crawling to a virtual standstill, or whatever the hell they decided to do with Rayla and Callum, these minor issues start to become much more apparent. And while we're here, let's talk a little bit about Raylan because what the hell? I didn't rewatch anything in the lead up to season 4, so it wasn't until after I'd finished the season that I found out they broke up in a supplementary comic book. Aaron, I'm not buying the DLC to your janky ass PowerPoint presentation. Don't do this. And the show itself never explains why they split, so every interaction this season is characterised by a foul awkwardness that most of the audience has no context for. And it's only going to get worse, because at least I remember there was some comic book released a few years ago, I just didn't think it was necessary reading. Anybody finding the Dragon Prince fresh from now on and binging it is just supposed to somehow know there's a comic they need to read between seasons 3 and 4 that the show never tells you about, or else the relationship between the two main characters won't make sense. And the fact that they're doing this to Raylan. One of the show's saving graces is staggering. Avatar couldn't find a lead couple that made all the fans happy. Korra couldn't. Voltron couldn't. The Dragon Prince did. Everyone liked Raylam. They were both lead characters. They both had agency. We understood what they saw in each other. It just worked. They got past the stage where they could shit the bed with shipping drama and then went back to shit the bed anyway, and basically reduced Rayla to nothing more than Callum's awkward ex for an entire season. How? Okay, so let's get back on track. More than 10 years after Avatar's finale, when people talk about it, one of the first things you'll probably hear is praise about how the show handled some unexpectedly heavy topics. Things like war, genocide and imperialism in posts, videos and articles, usually of the context of why Avatar's so popular, why it's a great show, why people should watch it, etc etc. With the general angle behind these being to convince someone who hasn't seen Avatar that there's more to it than the Nickelodeon cartoon it appears to be on the surface. And while I don't think that that praise is unwarranted, I also don't think that those topics are really the reason people enjoy Avatar as much as they do. When you're actually watching the series, you're not putting the next episode on because you want to be informed about the real politique of colonisation as a form of resource acquisition to fuel a military based economy. You put it on because you want to see how Zuko is going to reclaim his lost honour, how Aang's going to master his new bending, what shenanigans Sokka and Toph will get into, and because you want to see some cool choreographed fight scenes. And then every now and again you'll be blindsided by the story taking on heavier subject matter, which stands out to you because you didn't know you wanted the story to take that direction. Let's be real, any cartoon that has an evil bad guy who wants to take over the world technically has the themes of war and imperialism. Avatar isn't unique in that aspect, it's not a good show because it has heavy topics, it's a good show because of its characters, action and storytelling. And it's those things that draw people in so that they listen when it raises those heavy topics. The Dragon Prince has got this the wrong way around. At its heart, The Dragon Prince is a story about reconciliation and the fragility of peace, worthy topics that can lend themselves to interesting story ideas. However, it prioritises those messages over its story and action. Where Avatar would end plots with exciting climactic battles, Dragon Prince ends them on hokey speeches that just outline the story's basic themes. And there couldn't be a clearer example of this than in Season 4, where Ezrin's speech about pain and love awkwardly interrupts Claudia's action sequence, 
as though Ezrin's character model has just loaded in during the wrong cutscene. Hello ma'am, do you have a minute to talk about our Lord and Savior Lightning McQueen? This fight was not allowed to exist on its own merits. It had to be a platform for Ezrin reiterating the themes of the show, prioritizing messages over action and story. It hurts! I feel pain about this and I am angry! You can't just have your characters announce how they feel! That makes me feel angry! But what's worse is how the show seems so precious over its messages that it's too scared to question them. There are plenty of real world examples of long lasting conflicts where both sides are too entrenched to back down. Creating a lasting peace is difficult, and any story that wants to tackle those themes needs to explore those difficulties. But in the world of the Dragon Prince, whenever a leader tells the people, we, we should be peaceful, war is bad actually, that seems to be the end of it. Ezrin's speech is prompted by a human who's upset that humanity's old enemies are being invited to a sacred space but we don't see any of the anger among the crowd. We're only told about it. The crowd accept Ezrin's words with seemingly no original thought of their own. Wouldn't it be more compelling if someone were visibly upset and Ezrin actually had to confront them? Because anger and vengeance are, unfortunately, real human reactions to conflict, regardless of whether the person is good or bad. And while the Dragon Prince recognizes that through its speeches, in practice, it only wants to relegate those emotions to overt bad guys or events off screen that we never see. Like it was literally only last season when Ezrin was heroically cheered on while he massacred his own subjects on Dragonback, and now he's inviting those dragons to a human war memorial. I'm sure these people had families that would find it pretty rich that he's now preaching to them about how violence isn't the answer, but anyway, here's Wonderwall. As a comparison, in Avatar, when Katara tried to win over a crowd with a hokey speech, she was completely ignored, because that show understood that actions speak louder than words. So the episode became about Katara getting her point across in a way that was more meaningful to the prisoners, and in turn, the audience at home. If this was the Dragon Prince, Katara's speech would have worked first time and probably be needlessly dragged out over the course of seven episodes. Talking about needlessly dragging something out over the course of seven episodes, should we talk about the candle incident? This season's C plot involves a sun elf human conflict. The very silly setup is that humans made a camp for sun elf refugees, who do fire magic, but the camp is highly flammable. So, when an elf lights a funerary candle, a human puts it out, resulting in the human being attacked by the elf and put on trial for disrespecting elf traditions. Throughout the season, Kareem, the bad guy, whispers into Queen Janai's ear that the situation is a powder keg. Humans and elves are at each other's throats, and unless she makes an example of the woman arrested and executes her, she's showing the elves to be weak. In theory, Kareem is right. The elves have lost their capital, their traditions are all that remain. If the humans are allowed to snuff them out, what do they have left? And on the other side, the architect was only trying to prevent a fire, and she was the one attacked. Why is she being tried for death when the elf goes free? And Amaya even throws her under the bus, so are humans just second class citizens? Tension should be high on both sides. In canon, Kareem's wrong. Emotions never spill out into camp. There is literally no sign that anyone outside of the named characters has even the slightest opinion on the matter whatsoever. Because for whatever reason, the Dragon Prince doesn't want to portray its messages of peace and love coming under question from anyone other than the blatant bad guys. So the masses just become obedient, thoughtless NPCs waiting to receive their opinions from the episode's mouthpiece, completely removing any shades of grey or complexity from the subject matter and coming across as pretty tone deaf. And I can't help but feel that the legacy Avatar has of handling heavy topics is part of the reason the Dragon Prince continually bites off more than it can chew when it comes to its subject matter. And why it seems to think if it keeps hammering the same messages of peace and love, that people will eventually give it the same kudos they give ATLA, without realising that Avatar put in the legwork elsewhere before people really listen to it. But listen, one thing that the Dragon Prince does have is time. 
time to put some of these mistakes and others right. Season 4 was tough to take, especially given how long it took to arrive, but in that time, three more seasons were confirmed, which is a luxury few shows ever get. The story will get its complete run, and while I don't think that's an excuse for sacrificing this entire season, it might play out in the long run. And if it does, a lot of those issues won't matter as much. Relying on Avatar references for jokes isn't a real issue, although I would like the show's humour to decide if it's for 6 year olds or 16 year olds. I don't think it can really fix its world building stuff, but that won't matter so much as long as the Dragon Prince gets back to making the most of its characters and telling stories that actually go somewhere. As for the themes, I'm hoping the show can really take its last three seasons to explore them honestly. Show normal people turning their back on hokey speeches and taking matters into their own hands. Have maybe one or two good characters reach a breaking point and relapse into their old distrust of elves or humans. And make it so that the good guys don't always have the right moral answer. Give us some actual tension that explores the human failings that makes peace difficult, which is essentially the theme of the show, and don't palm everything off onto purple Illuminati daddy. Like, it's not really an honest exploration of the frailties of peace if the solution is To achieve peace, first you must imprison gay Satan in the mirror dimension. Stop worrying so much about presenting the right messages all the time and make sure that you're prioritising your character's story and action. Because if the Dragon Prince really wants to replicate Avatar, which, let's be honest, it kinda does, that's where the story needs to focus its attention. Although no matter how much it fixes, I will never forgive this show for using the name Corvus on a character who isn't the Crowmaster. I refuse to look past that. Anyway, video over. That was The Dragon Prince Season 4, out of 10. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, I've been meaning to cover this show for a long time, so if you want to see more Dragon Prince content, then let me know, and yeah, thanks.